Hello and welcome back to the channel. Here we talk about character builds for Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, we talk about game mechanics, uh, what we are doing today. We also talk about classes and subclasses and just about anything else D&D related. Uh, my name is Nathan. Today we are talking about forced movement. Uh, here is our agenda for today. We're gonna, I'm going to talk about types of forced movement and some applications including falling damage and hazardous areas, specifically things like spells. Now, why talk about force movement? Well, there are several reasons. Uh, one of the first reasons is um, force movement is actually one of the most powerful um, things that you can do in the game. Um, between like moving enemies around and um, controlling positioning, it's actually a lot more powerful than a lot of people um, realize. And it's a it's a feature that often goes, un, in my in my experience, underused at a lot of tables, both by players and by dungeon masters. Now, if you're the dungeon master, one way you can encourage your players to to take advantage of things that can push or pull or make an enemy or run away or that kind of thing um, is to make interesting battlefields that have say, pits or spikes or difficult terrain like thorns, maybe areas of the ground that are on fire that kind of thing, um, to encourage players to use these things even if they're not integrating them into their build. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the different types and that kind of thing. So there are two, uh, all force movement falls into one of two main categories. There's the kind of pushing or pulling category, and there's forced walking or fleeing, is what I'm going to call it. Um, so let's break these down a little bit. So pushing and pulling, um, this specifically does not provoke opportunity attacks from other creatures. Uh, while forced walking can provoke opportunity attacks. Sometimes it does. Um, an example of this is something like the Dissonant Whisper spell, where it makes the enemy um, like move in a specific direction. And if you can line up all your allies next to them, they can run by and everybody gets a swing at them if they pass by. Um, some of those spells say that they'll avoid the, any obvious hazards, and oftentimes that can mean uh, they might avoid creatures or, or specific areas. So getting to that, with, when you push or pull, you have control. The pusher or puller has control over where the target goes based on where they're standing and that kind of thing. Whereas uh, with the forced walking or fleeing, the target controls where it goes, which again is important because uh, unless uh, some of the forced walking spells will say the target has to like flee you or approach you by the most direct means possible. Um, and usually there's a, sometimes there'll be a clause in there that says it avoids any, any obvious traps or hazards. So anything it knows is dangerous. Um, and like it won't run off a cliff and that kind of thing. So, uh, that category is a little more broad, whereas pushing and pulling, you, you have a lot more direct control. So here's some examples of ways you can push and pull. Uh, the first one, uh, most basic, that everybody has access to is shoving. So shoving is a special kind of attack. Uh, you can read about it in the player's handbook, but, but basically, if you can succeed, it's kind of like grappling. Um, if you can succeed again, uh, on an, uh, what was the contested athletics check, um, you can either push them five feet away from you or knock them prone. Um, another example is grappling and dragging. So Grappling is similar mechanically to shoving in that you make a contested athletics check. Target can use, I think, athletics or acrobatics to try to contest it. But if, if you succeed, you have them grappled and you've got them. In. And then you can move around um, and you can move at half speed. But when you do, you can drag them back and forth. So they stand next to you. And the important thing with that is you can, again, you can move them under your control. With your movement specifically, um, once you have them grappled, which is an advantage of that method because it doesn't take your action once you've got them secured. Uh, another example is the Eldritch Blast uh, cantrip plus in, uh, specific invocations. Um, there's one that allows you to push an enemy 10 feet away from you every time you hit with it, and another one once per turn that allows you to pull a creature that you hit with it 10 feet closer to you. Um, another example is the telekinetic feat. Uh, this lets you shove a, a creature five feet in any direction with a bonus action, and the, depending on, they have to make a saving throw against um, a DC based on the attribute you increased with the feet. It, it's a half feet. 
usually that means you have to make a save against your spell casting modifier. Um, and uh, you can do it with a bonus action. So that's a good, uh, a very good use um, case. Uh, another example is cantrips like Thorn Whip or Lightning Lure, that kind of thing, that when you hit the enemy, they, they get pulled uh, directly closer to you. So, some examples of Force Blocking or Clean. There's the Command Spell. The first level spell pretty basic. Um, specifically, the Approach and Flee commands. So, generally, Lifted Ones will make the target come toward you or away from you. Um, also, Distant Whispers, like we mentioned above. There's also... Um, some of the more powerful fear spells will say that the target has to spend its turn like running from you. Um, and so that that can potentially provoke opportunity attacks as well. Um, turn undead kind of falls into that category. Um, also, uh, mind control type spells, if, if you can get control of the creature and force it to walk in a certain air, uh, way, like dominate person, dominate monster, that kind of thing, you can make it to take opportunity attacks by walking around. Uh, usually those will say, like, the creature will try to resist you if you, like, walk it off a cliff or something like that. Um, so be aware of that. Uh, but uh, speaking of walking off a cliff, let's talk about falling damage. So falling damage. A creature takes 1d6 bludgeoning damage for every 10 feet it falls, up to 20d6, which, mean, which is a 200-foot uh, drop. Uh, so... Um, Generally speaking for this, pushing or pulling works best because you have control of where the target goes. Um, this is not always applicable, um, specifically because um, most tables play with the board being very flat. Like there might be a tree here, um, uh, but it's rather rare for um, there to be significant um, elevation in a, um, in a tabletop game, specifically. Uh, but that doesn't mean there can't be. Um, so if there's a ledge and an enemy is standing next to it, you can push them off. Um, they might fall to their death if it's, if it's too far. Um, and uh, as, as a dungeon master, if you want your players to potentially do this, you'll need to, again, set up height uh, differences. And, uh, you know, if your DM has prepared a cliff, um, be prepared for a monster to try to shove you over it too, right? All right, so next we're going to talk about hazard, hazardous areas, um, specifically spells. And this is a big one um, for, as a player, one, um, you can use a lot of spells, whether cast by you or your allies, to get the most out of forced movement. So um, there are kind of two big categories that we're going to talk about in spells that can benefit a lot from this. The first one is there's a lot of spells that make a creature take damage when they enter the area for the first time on a turn or start their turn there. The important thing about this is that means that potentially every turn, uh, whether it's your turn or another player's turn or another monster's turn, they can take the damage um, from the spell. So uh, let's talk about a couple specific examples in Spirit Guardians and Moonbeam. Now, Spirit Guardians is an aura that's centered on you. I believe it's a 15-foot radius. Um, and when you move, it moves with you. Now, the important thing is uh, with both these spells, um, is that if you move the area onto a creature on your turn, they don't have to make the save, they, they don't take the damage. That's a specific ruling. So just walking the, the dangerous area around, whether it's with the, um, uh, the action or bonus action to move it, like Moonbeam, or um, by moving yourself with Spirit Guardians, if you put a creature in the aura that way, they don't have to make the save. But they, you know, they qualify for the first time they start their turn there. But if you can use some kind of force movement on your turn to make them enter the area, whether it's a push or a pull or some kind of forced movement, then you can force them to take the damage because they're entering the area. Um, at, so force movement specifically qualifies for that first time on a turn. So, for example, if you had the Spirit Guardian spell going as a cleric and you knew the command spell, you could command a, uh, well, no, this actually, command specifically doesn't work um, uh, because it requires, the creature doesn't act until their turn. So um, if you, let's say, again, Spirit Guardians is going, um, you have the telekinetic feet. You walk up to them 20 feet away. Uh, then you use your bonus action to shove them into the aura with Spirit Guardians. If they fail their save against the shove, they would get pushed in. 
and take the damage. And then you end your turn, it's their turn, they start their turn there, they take the damage again. Um, another way to do this, for example, is with something like uh, the Thornweb cantrip. If you're a nature cleric or you have a druid dip or something like that and you know this cantrip, it can potentially pull a target closer to you. So if you position the aura in such a way that when they get pulled closer to you, they enter the aura, then they take the damage. Um, Spirit Guardian specifically is a little hard to work with because it moves with you. Um, but let's talk about the Moonbeam spell real quick. So this spell creates a hazardous area of light. Um, you can move it on your turn, um, but again, it has that same mechanic that when a creature enters the area for the first time on a turn or starts their turn there, they take the damage. So let's say that, for example, you're a druid. Druids have the easy access to this spell. And let's say that you're a moon druid because uh, this is a very applicable tactic to them. Uh, you can shapeshift. You can grab, uh, well, first you cast a spell to make the area, then you can shapeshift. Um, and on later turns, you can run up to somebody, you can grapple them as a bear, hold on to them, and you can walk them, or you, you can drag them in, uh, into the moonbeam to make them take the damage. Uh, then they'll start their turn in the moonbeam, and they'll take the damage again. And on subsequent turns, you can drag them out, and drag them back in, and they take the damage. So... That is a very applicable tactic. Um, also, if you have some kind of forced movement ability and one of your allies puts down a spell like this, you can push them in or pull them in and out of the aura on your turn and potentially make, to make them take the damage once. So in the aforementioned example where you're the druid, let's say you have a cleric friend that has spirit guardians, you could grapple a target and drag them into the spirit guardians to make them take the damage. Um, there are other spells that can that make a target take damage based on how much they move in the area. Um, the specific example I want to refer to here is Spike Growth. So this spell makes them take damage based on how much they move. Um, if the target is in it, um, you can push or pull them around, and they just take damage based on how far you moved. So again, let's use the Moon Druid example. Let's say you set up your Spike Growth, and you grapple your target. You can drag them side to side such that they're in the spike growth and you're not, and basically, like you're a cheese grater, you're just grating the enemy on the spike growth. And that can be really powerful and um, another way to get a lot of damage if you have a spell like that. Um, let's say that you're a warlock and your druid friend has cast spike growth, and you've got Repelling Blast and Grasp of Hadar, which are the two invocations that allow you to push people or pull them. You can Eldritch Blast them, push them, deeper into it, and then pull them back with the Grasp of Hadar on the next Eldritch Blast and push them again. And you can, again, grate them like a block of cheese on the Spike Growth back and forth. Um, there is a specific Warlock subclass that gets access to the Spike Growth spell that can do that. Um, and there are a lot of other things beyond the ones I mentioned that you can push and pull. I just wanted to give a quick coverage and example. So, uh, thank you for watching. I hope this... Uh, video got you thinking about um, force movement and just some ways you can apply it to your character builds or maybe to your table as a dungeon master. Uh, don't be afraid to use the same tactics your players are using uh, against them. So if your players uh, drop a spike growth, don't be afraid to have a monster try to grapple them and drag them off on it or push them into it uh, with a shove, push them off a cliff. Um, I find that um, if both sides are considering how to use force movement, it can make the game a lot more interesting. So, thanks for watching, and I will catch you. Well, actually, one more little thing here. Uh, another reason I wanted to release this video is my next couple of builds are going to be leveraging force mechanics, uh, movement mechanics, specifically to get more damage. So, if you've watched the video to uh, this far, that's your little hint for my next build, and uh, I will see you next time.